Good morning. <laughs> Francis, it's good to see you back too. Uh, yeah, I'm going to have cardiac uh, therapy. Rehab. 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 So I should be getting much better. Okay. You're going to make a heart do your next, do some exercises. All right. And we'll go for it. We'll go for it. <clears throat> the slide says this morning that we're in 34, 35. We're actually 33 to 35 because we didn't get through 33 last week, but I think it connects better with 34 and 35. Right. as well as it did with, uh, with 31 and 32 that, that we were looking at. Last week's word for the day, a week or whatever, was hopelessness. And uh, we talked about how uh, chapters 31 through 33, known as the Book of Consolation, we had all of this down, 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 and then last week, we're getting we're getting into some some hopeful um, hopeful areas and, and uh, some, some some consolation. Uh, and Clyde Francisco, you might recall uh, this uh, quote I had from him: "No more stirring passages ever were written than those found in this section this section of Jeremiah." So you know, you get down, go to thirty one through thirty three, uh, get that get that consolation. So. Today's word is covenant. Now, we had covenant some last week when we were talking about the new covenant. I mentioned that uh, uh, chapter, um, uh, chapter 32 uh, is the only place in the Bible, in the, in the Old Testament, where, where the words new covenant, the phrase new covenant, uh, is mentioned. And it's from there we get the idea of New Testament, Old Testament. Etc. So, um, what what uh, what's something that you've done your entire life because your parents, um, your family, uh, some other group did it? Why? What's what's something that you've hung on to as tradition just because somebody else did it? Prayer before meals. Prayer before meals. Okay. Okay. You know the traditions that you had on to. In the well, Christmas traditions, Christmas yeah. and Thanksgiving. Christmas and, 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 and Thanksgiving. Had yeah, so so do you open the gifts the night, you know, yeah, well, the night the morning, before, the morning of, uh, you know, and, and et cetera. <laughs> you know, who, you know, uh, my, uh, my grandmother had a uh, tradition of, of having Christmas on a separate day so all family could come and, and, and flock in, you know, so, so different traditions there. Um, back in the early days in the church where I grew up, very right-wing, very law-keeping, um, baptism kind of became a tradition, and it lost, it didn't, they didn't explain the meaning of it okay. like, like okay. we know now. So, so. And it was just, I mean, you just, when you just went to church, you were baptized. When you became 10 or 11 years old, everybody did it. Yeah. And it just became a tradition. Yeah. Uh, there's there's a, a, a Christmas tradition uh, with me and at my upbringing. Uh, my grandfather every year for Christmas would bring a box of chocolate covered cherries to my mother. Now, I don't know how that tradition got started, uh, but, but, uh, uh, and he may have brought, he may have brought them to everybody. He owned a store and they, they may have gotten a case of chocolate covered cherries in and given them all the kids. I don't know, but I, I remember it was very special to my mother that, that her father brought her this, 50 cent box, 50 cents at that time, probably a chocolate covered cherry. Well, when I was a young teenager, my grandfather died. The next year, 
I started giving my mother a box of chocolate covered cherries. <coughs> and I did that. Actually, Chris did that for her. <laughs> she, she was ordered to, to care of it. <laughs> did that every year until my mother died. And then when my mother died, our daughter Jill started buying a box of chocolate covered cherries and giving it to me. Oh, how nice. Now, the funny thing is, none of us are that fond of chocolate covered cherries. You know, I mean, we like them. Yeah, I, you know, I can remember uh, two or three years ago that that box sat there for a long time before they they got all eaten. Uh, and it's not one of those big boxes. It's just a little box. But uh, but anyway, why would I do that? Why would we continue that? I like the candy canes. I used to have the candy canes and the Christmas tree. And then it brought that meaning that the, the red meat represents Jesus' blood and the white means right. this and that because right. of the uh, cleaning the sins. Love yeah, person. yeah, That's yeah. Love. Uh, I'm doing it. it. It continues to honor a relationship, does it not? To honor the relationship. My, my relationship with both my mother and my grandfather, uh, our daughter's relationship with me uh, and, and her grandmother. Uh, and, and so we, we do these things Sometimes out of tradition, but we're really doing it to honor that relationship. Right. Isn't that what covenant is all about? Yes. It, when we keep covenant with God, we're honoring our relationship with God. We're honoring the past and those things that, that God has done. And certainly if you look at the at, at the Jewish people at the at the and the Israelites and, and, and how God brought them out of Egypt. Uh, God took care of them. God, uh, you know, such a great covenant he built with them because he wanted a special people. He wanted a people that were different from the nations. He wanted a people that, uh, that other nations could look to and looking to them, they would look to him. And that was a good past. It was always a good past, a strong past. It wasn't a bad past. Yeah, God absolutely. God reminded them all the time of that. Yeah, and and so God, so so covenant, covenant is honoring them, those things that that God did. Uh, the um, dictionary of the evangelical. evangelical Dictionary Theology defines covenant this way. A compact or agreement between two parties binding them mutually to undertakings on each other's behalf. When used of the relationship between God and people, it denotes a gracious undertaking entered into by God for the benefit and blessings of people and specifically of those who by faith receives the, receive the promises and commit themselves to the obligations which this undertaking involves. The, um, the, the quote goes on, the general characteristics of the Old Testament word for covenant, berit is the Old Testament word, is its unalterable and permanently binding character. The parties to a covenant obligating themselves to carry out their respective commitments under the penalty of divine retribution should they later attempt to avoid them. Each member of the covenant agreed to fulfill the terms of the relationship regardless of the actions by the other. The characteristic statement of the covenant God made with his people occurs in the formula, I will be their God and they shall be my people. And that statement is found four times in the book of Jeremiah. This signified that God unreservedly gave himself to his people and that they in turn gave themselves to him and belonged to him. Thus they were his peculiar treasure. Notice I said they obligated themselves to carry out the covenant. This is not just a promise. This is not just a handshake deal. 
this is this is a very serious uh, serious solidifying of relationship and when that uh, relationship that when relation that relationship is broken there's a penalty to be paid for breaking the relationship part of that penalty is not having a relationship anymore but but there's other other uh, more coming. we'll we'll talk about more about covenant in a minute I want to start back in chapter 33 uh, a little bit though we have uh, in chapter 33 which we've got you know all, all the all the evidence is pointing toward an unrecovered catastrophe unrecoverable catastrophe but in chapter 33 God shows that he's got plans and he's got purposes and he says in verse 3 call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. Great and unsearchable things. So he lists some of these in 30 and 33. And we sort of got this outline uh, as, as these passages go through. First of all, one of the unsearchable things that they do not know is that God planned to turn death into life. Verse 4. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says about the houses in the city and the royal palaces of Judah that have been torn down to be used against the sea tramps and the sword and the fight with the Babylonians. They will be filled with the dead bodies of the people. I will slay in my anger and wrath. I will hide my face from the city because of all this witness, with wickedness. Nevertheless, I will bring health and healing to it. I will heal my people. I will and will let them enjoy abundant peace and security. That death turned into life. Uh, the, the Hebrew words, and I've got the underlying health and healing, the Hebrew words refer to forming a new flesh over a wound. New flesh, newness will come out of it. Death will be turned into life. That's one of those unsearchable things that, that uh, uh, God, will, God will tell them. Then he'll turn deficiency into abundance. Verse 7. I'll bring Judah and Israel back from captivity and rebuild them as they were before. And don't verse 9. Then this city will bring me renown, joy, praise, and honor before all nations on earth that hear of all the good things I do for it. And they will be in awe and will tremble at the abundant prosperity and peace I provide for it. That relationship's going to be back the way God wanted it to start with, they will, they will be bringing renown, joy, praise, and honor. Deficiency, this captivity, into abundance. He's going to turn stains of sin into cleansing and forgiveness. Verse 8, I will cleanse them from all the sin they've committed against me. Forgive all their sins or rebellion against me. Uh, the reason for his discipline is going to be removed because he's going to, to cleanse it. He's going to, to uh, cleanse it with forgiveness. He's going to turn desolation into prosperity. Verse 10. This is what the Lord says. You say about this place, it is a desolate waste without people or animals. Yet in the towns of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem that are deserted, inhabited by neither people nor animals, there will be heard once more the sounds of joy and gladness, the voices of bride and bridegroom, the voices of those who bring thank offerings to the house of the Lord, saying, Give thanks to the Lord Almighty, for the Lord is good, his love endures forever. For I will restore the fortunes of the land as they were before. What would come was, was new life, new relationships, new growth. This is part of those unsearchable things of God, of how he could, could bring this about. <clears throat> Continues, this is what the Lord Almighty says, in this place, desolate and without people or animals. I've just read that. I? No, I haven't. Uh, sounds similar. In all those towns, there will begin pastures for shepherds to rest their flocks. The towns of the hill country, the western foothills, and of the new Gap. In the territory of Benjamin, the villages around Jerusalem, the towns of Judah, flocks will again pass 
under the hand of one who counts them, says the Lord. Again, that idea of bringing, bringing prosperity, bringing things new, bringing things the way they should be. Turning hopelessness into hope. Verse 14, the days are coming to declare the Lord when I will fulfill the good promises promised I made to the people of Israel and Judah. In those days and at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called the Lord, our righteous Savior. And so he's saying, Part of these unsearchable things is, I'm going to bring you a Messiah. I'm going to bring you a Savior. The, the righteous branch sprout from David's line. He'll do just what's just and, and, and right in the land. Israel will live in safety. The Lord, our righteous Savior, will he be called. And finally, um, I'm not reading all my passages before I go on. But this is what the Lord says, David will never fail to have a man to sit on the throne of Israel. Nor will the Le Levitical priest ever fail to have a man to stand before me continually to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, to present sacrifices. And then finally, he goes back to that covenant, that unbreakable covenant. Before, before we read that passage, look what he, what he said. He, he's going to tell great and unsearchable things. Death is going to be turned into life. <laughs> Death into life. What's, what's, what's dead is going to be reborn. Deficiency into abundance. Things are not going to be just normal. They're going to be abundant. They're going to be fabulous. The, the stains of sin into, into for cleansing of forgiveness. The desolation into prosperity. Hopelessness into hope. Can you see the people just, just thinking about what they're going through and then looking and saying, wow, there, there, there's, something, there's something coming. There's something coming. Um, you know, I, I'm sure many of us have a little bit of despair about what's going on in this country right now. A little bit concerned. And I don't want to get into it too much, but there, there's been research on generations that have shown that we go, go through cycles in this country. That we go through good times. And then we go through strange times, and then we go through bad times, and then we come return to good times. So I would say that those cycles continue. There's there's hope there, but certainly our hope shouldn't be under um, depending upon some kind of story recycling. Our hope is in God, and, and, and no matter what what that situation is. You know, I, I said earlier in this uh, in this series that we're not guaranteed to live a wonderful life because Jeremiah certainly did not live a wonderful life. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, but God's God's promised us a relationship that even though there be death, there's life. Even deficiency, there's abundance, sin, forgiveness, desolation, prosperity, hopelessness, and a hopefulness. And then that unbreakable covenant. Verse 19. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. This is what the Lord says. If you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night, so that day and night no longer come at their point in time, then my covenant with David, my servant, and my covenant with the Levites, or priests ministering before me, can be broken. And David will no longer have a de descendant to reign on his throne. I'll make the descendants of David, my servant, and the Levites who minister before me as countless as the stars in the sky, as measureless as the sand on the seashore. Word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, 
Have you not noticed that these people are saying the Lord's rejected the two kingdoms he chose so that his spies might be and no longer regard them as a nation? This is what the Lord says. If I have not made my covenant with the day and night and established the laws of heaven, then I will reject the descendants of Jacob and David, my servant, and will not choose one of his sons to rule over the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For I restore their fortunes and have compassion on them. God says he's given us them a covenant that cannot be broken. But you notice what, what the people are saying? Verse 24, have you, have you not noticed that the Lord has rejected the two kingdoms he chose? The people are saying, you've rejected us. It's you who broke the covenant, God. It's you who broke the covenant. <laughs> The Lord, look at it's pointing. The Lord has rejected the two kingdoms he chose. I don't know about you, but I, I imagine I could search for a long time and not find exactly where God chose two kingdoms. In fact, God didn't choose one earthly kingdom, did he? It was, it was God's idea to put a king on the throne, right? Yeah. No. No. God chose to be king himself. And, and yet, you know, the people are saying God's rejected his two kingdoms he chose. They despise my people and no longer regard them as a nation. Look at all these people around us. They, they despise us. They don't regard us as a nation anymore. Well, if they had you tried to be with like all the rest of them around them, maybe they would have had more respect to them. <clears throat> you want to be part of You want to be like me? Okay, you can just come be part of me. Yeah. But God says, ah, if I have not made my covenant with day and night and established the laws of heaven, then I reject the descendants of Jacob. He says, as, as sure as day followed, night follows day. Continue. That's, that's my covenant. That's my relationship with you. If you can break that, then you can break my covenant. But not before. And this, this idea of this, this eternal relationship with God is covered other places in the Bible. So Psalm 102, you remain the same. Your years will never end. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Revelation 1, 8, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, who is, and says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And so God says, I'm the faithful God. And and just to just to prove his faithfulness, let's go into chapter 34. So in chapter 34, the year is 588 BC. Nebuchadnezzar's <clears throat> army is successfully successfully conquering the kingdom of Judah. The last two towns. Lachish as as, as God. They're about to fall. They're the only 45 towns that are left. Uh, the next stop's Jerusalem. And, and not only has Nebuchadnezzar brought his invincible Babylonian troops, but he's also demanded that the vassal countries that he's already conquered, that they send their soldiers to fight against uh, against Judah. So we've got the entire Near East attacking God's people. Now, don't try to relate that today, okay? <laughs> this is, it's, it's, there isn't a tendency to do that, isn't there? Yeah. Uh, I don't believe that the, uh, the Israel today is the same God's people, that God, God's covenant people. Uh, even though, you know, very much feel for, them, for what's happening over there. And so God sends 
and Jeremiah to King Zedekiah with a message. This message tells him wonderful, two wonderful things. You're about to lose the city. You're going to be captured and taken away. You're going to lose your freedom as well. And uh, I don't have verse three down here, but uh, verse verse three says, "You will not escape from his grasp, but you'll surely be captured and given into his hands. You will see the king of Babylon with your own eyes, and he will speak with you face to face." And that that uh, that phrase literally it reads. Your eyes will see the eyes of the king of Babylon, and his mouth will speak with your mouth. You're, you're going to be you're going to be there in, in close relationship, and uh, we know that that happens later in chapter fifty-two. And so, God then makes a covenant with Zedekiah. He makes a promise to Zedekiah. Yet hear the Lord's promise to you, King Zedekiah, king of Judah. This is what the Lord says concerning you. You will not, not die by the sword. You will die peacefully as people made a funeral fire in honor of your predecessors. The kings who ruled before you so they will make a fire in your honor and lament. Alas, Master, I myself make this promise, declares the Lord. Why would God do this? To this guy who's, who's forsaken the covenant? Why would he grant him this grace? He's tested by God. He said he, he could implant the plan of God. Is I don't know the answer. <laughs> um, maybe this is God giving Zedekiah one last chance <laughs> to respond to to to, to repent. Um, maybe it's God showing His covenant nature. God showing His His faithfulness that despite everything. You know, I've I made a covenant with you. I've made a promise with you. And yet, God's going to let his people fall down? If it, has that shown to be a covenant God? The hope of Zedekiah, you're going to have. How does this work? It's the people, the <laughs> wrong that makes them unfaithful to God. And it's not God. God is a faithful God. But these people are, are not obeying God. Now, when you go back to Deuteronomy, and, and, and God has the people, he's got two mountains there, Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. You've got a mount of blessings and you've got a mount of cursings. And God basically tells the people, we have there your blessings if you follow me, and there's cursings if you don't follow me. It's this covenant relationship uh, has to deal with uh, uh, with not only blessing but also with discipline. Seems like God almost bleed for them. Oh yeah, the compassion, the love that yeah. God has, and He cries His heart out to them, and they still don't get it. You know, we we have a grandson who can get wild sometimes. <laughs> yeah, so Anybody, uh, you know, identifying with that, you know, six year old grandson, and uh, he he can get in trouble in school and and and, and in other places, and uh, you know. Um, he doesn't like it when you discipline him. But why do we do that? Why do his parents do that? Because they know what's best. Yeah, because because we love him. Because we want that. We want to strengthen. We strengthen the covenant relationship we have with him through discipline. We remain faithful 
with our covenant relationship with him when we discipline him. And, and, yeah, that, that love. Um, and and that's, that's how God does it. He, he doesn't want a people that are just like everybody else. That, that are okay to uh, to worship him in the temple and then go worship their idols outside of the temple. And if he's not if he if he's if he's not going to allow them to have that, then he's going to have to bring discipline. And this discipline increases with the amount of uh, of, of their their fault. Uh, it's, it increased to to the amount that he has to say, okay. We're going to have to really show the people what this is all about. That this is like going back to Egypt. That this is being enslaved. It's only for 70 years, but hey, 70 years ought to be long enough for you to learn to listen. And then we'll bring prosperity. And so God, God shows his faithfulness to the covenant, through the discipline that he brings. And yet, at the same time, he has the grace to tell Zedekiah that you're still going to be honored of this. They're, they're still going to, to, uh, to make a funeral fire in your honor. You're not going to die through this. Well, Zedekiah turns around and just shows him how unfaithful he could be then, if we're talking about cover. The, uh, the law required that any Hebrew who held a fellow Hebrew in slavehood was, uh, was supposed to let him go free, free in the seventh year. Sooner than that, if the year of Jubilee was coming. Of course, the, you think, well, how do Hebrews get, get to be master and slave? Well, you know, it, it would come from, from one Hebrew selling himself into the other servitude to, to, to pay off a debt or, or whatever. But the, the law was, you know, this is, this, is, uh, this is supposed to be cleared up after the seventh year. Um, of course, it was... Was a rule the people had been following for years, and so all of a sudden here uh, in um, thirty four eight through twenty two, they decide that uh, that they're going to they're going to release their slaves. And why now? What's 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 going on here? Well, you've got uh, you got are so your, your answers are so you know I can't, I can't sort through them in so many. You know, it could be a matter of conscience. Finally, you know, maybe God's getting through to some of them. But, you know, or maybe if we bribe God with obeying this law, uh, maybe God will will help us out. That's probably more likely. Yeah, yeah probably more likely. For however many yeah. years this has been going on. Right. Um, I mean, to, to make this sudden turnaround after years and years and years and years of it not happening, uh, this shows, okay, we're, we're, we're with you, God. We're with yeah. you, God. Or maybe even more likely, the people are fixing it. They're, they're getting fixing to get slaughtered by, by Nebuchadnezzar. They're fixing to get enslaved by Nebuchadnezzar. They're bound to know this by now, whether God's and Jeremiah is telling them that or not. They're bound to know it's it's gonna happen. I mean, the whole world is surrounding them. They're not gonna get out of this. And why do I carry this burden of, of, of having having to keep up with slaves when I'm enslaved? Why don't we just just you know? So it's uh, maybe it's just a, a way of, of getting their burden off their neck. 
It's so much like what happens today is we hear the word of God and we obey it, and then something else comes along and well, we that we don't have that anymore. Yeah. And the consequences have been taken away. Yeah, exactly. Let's read from verse 15. That's exactly what you're saying. Recently, you repented and did what is right in my sight. Each of you proclaimed freedom to your own people. You even made a covenant before me in the house that bears my name. Notice, they made a covenant with God. They were serious about this. But now you've turned around and profaned my name. Each of you has taken back um, the male and female uh, slaves you had set free uh, to go where they wished. Uh, you forced them to become your slaves again. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. You've not obeyed me. You've not proclaimed freedom to your own people. So now I proclaim freedom for you, declares the Lord. Freedom to fall by the sword, plague and famine. I'll make you abhorrent to all the kingdoms of the earth. And, and so uh, what what God through Jeremiah is saying, you repented. You said, okay, we're not, we're not going to follow this anymore. You know, we're, we're going to go back to God. And of course, repent means turn around. And then, as soon as the armies began backing off, because if you read the other passages, that's what happened. The armies began backing off. You, you turned around. You turned around profane night. You, you took them back in. So what does repent mean? Turn around. Turn around means repent. So they repented of repenting is what they did. Repented of repenting. Um, and God says, okay, you're going to proclaim freedom. I'm going to give freedom, you freedom. You can freely choose captivity now because that's what you've chosen. I really like the way that God worded that to the people because it's okay. You can freedom to do what you want to do, but you don't have to pay the penalty. That's right. It. That's right. Yeah. You 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 take you you bring it on. Freedom. Freedom to fall by the sword, plague, and famine. Of course, those three words we we see a lot of times in Jeremiah. So so we see in one instance, God's being faithful. By saying, hey, you know, my covenant's still there, you know, I, you know, I, you're Zedekiah, you're not gonna, you're not gonna die from this. And then they turn right around, they show their unfaithfulness. And then just to make it even worse, we've got another group coming in chapter 35. These Rechabites. Uh and we don't know much about uh, the Rechabites. Uh, I understand that they uh, uh, are, are similar to the Kenites or akin to the Kenites. And the Kenites, uh, that's where Moses got his wife, right? Um, most scholars, that they talk about uh, Jonadab here in this passage, one of their ancestors setting up some laws. And um, most scholars would say that it's the same Jonad Jonadab who assisted King Jehu, the, the northern king, in his religious purge of Baalism, out, out of uh, uh, just uh, following the reign of Ahab. And so, you know, here, here is an ancestor 250 years before, maybe. And they have followed what this, this ancestor's wishes for at least 250 years, if it's the same guy. And he, he talks about, um, um, he, he tells them to be homeless. They were homeless. They were tent-dwelling nomads. They were opposed to agriculture. Uh, they didn't drink the fruit of the vine. Uh, and, and so they, they have come in the city because of this oppression coming uh, from Babylon. And so Jeremiah take, takes them into a side room in the temple and he offers them strong drink and what do they say what do they do say no thank you they say no thank you why not 
surely some of them would have said, oh, finally, I get a taste of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They chose to honor what Jonadab, their ancestor, had told them to do. And they chose to honor this all of these years. <laughs> and this is in total difference to what the people of Israel do. You know, there's there's nothing that Jonadab could promise them for, for following all these rules. And, and, and some of these rules are would be similar to it in the Nazarite vow, but the Nazarite vow was not uh, it was not a, a lifelong vow in most cases. Um, so you, you've got a lifelong vow to, uh, to not be part of the town, to, uh, uh, to be opposed to agriculture, to, to, to be opposed to, 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 uh, to wine. Yeah, to live in camps. And, and, and yet... Here they were following the rule. And God says, here's your good example, Israel. Verse 12. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Go and tell the people of Judah and, and, and those living in Jerusalem, will you not learn a lesson and obey my words? declares the Lord. And isn't that what you, what you want to tell that grandchild child is at times? You know? Can't you learn? Can't you learn? Well, sometimes we act just like Israel act. Sometimes we can't learn either. And so you have the example here. God's faithfulness, Judah's unfaithfulness. <coughs> An example of human faithfulness. It can be done. It can be done. You can follow what God set up. You can identify with that covenant relationship uh, with God. Uh, and that's, you know, I think that's what God wants of us, continually wants of us to do. That the covenant relationship, that being part of him, that following him, no matter what, that living a life, maybe not a wonderful life, a life with him. I'm waiting for the bell now. I can't believe this. <laughs> Comments, questions. Maybe they didn't put the bell on. <laughs> I'm usually, I'm usually, I was rushing to get to it. That was good. Any, any comments, any questions? Yes, I was just thinking about with 9-11 occurring and how the people in this country, you know, started turning to God because they realized how important that was and, and how much they needed him and everything. True. But how long did that last? How long did it last? Yeah. Or, or after the pandemic, how yeah. long did it last? Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. I mean, we're we're still we're we're two or three years after the pandemic now, yeah. and people still haven't gotten into the habit of returning to fellowship. Yeah. That's right. How you know? Well, and, you know uh, I just think uh, <clears throat> well, the human heart they believe in power. They believe in uh, doing it on themselves, you know, and not believing in God. But the record box show us that it can be done. It can yeah. be done. And thank y'all for being true to your covenant. Thank I you. Thank you.